Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's healthcare provider program, Dying is Not Giving Up, discussing end of life with your patients. We're glad you could join us today. My name is Stephanie Washburn, and I'm the manager of healthcare provider outreach at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, or LBBC. I'm pleased to serve as your moderator today. This program is part of LBBC's Young Women's Initiative, which provides resources tailored to meet the specific needs of women diagnosed with breast cancer before age 45. The Young Women's Initiative began in 2011 when we were awarded a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to expand and strengthen our programs for young women. This CDC funding continues today. We selected today's topic because of its importance to people with breast cancer and because of the essential role played by healthcare providers in supporting patients at end of life. We're looking to forward to the format of today's program in which we will see the documentary, Dying is Not Giving Up. We're showing the film for educational purposes and to open the conversation about death and dying with providers. After the film, we will move to discussion with our expert speaker, Kelly Grosslogs, who is also the executive producer of Dying is Not Giving Up. We thank Kelly for sharing her time and expertise with us today. You'll learn more about Kelly shortly. Now let's move on to a few final details before the presentation. Today we'll be using the chat feature to connect during the program. You'll see the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. We'll be using the Q&A feature too, which is also located at the bottom of your screen. Please submit questions for Kelly throughout the program. We ask that you frame your questions in a general way so they can be helpful to all participants, maintaining confidentiality by leaving out any patient-specific information. Kelly will respond to as many questions as possible. For participants who would like to use closed captioning, you can select this feature by clicking the up arrow button next to closed caption on the bottom of your screen. Then click show subtitles to start displaying the captions. We'll be emailing you a link to our program evaluation later today. Your feedback is very important to us in planning future programs, and we appreciate you taking the time to complete the evaluation. If you've registered to receive nursing contact hours or social work CEs for the program, you are required to participate in the entire live webinar and to complete the evaluation by October 13th. You will then be emailed your continuing education certificate by November 3rd. This activity has been approved by the Ohio Nurses Association and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation for 1.25 contact hours. It's also approved by the National Association of Social Workers for 1CE. Unfortunately, we're unable to provide counseling CEs for this program. However, certificates of participation will be available upon request through the evaluation process. I would also like to note that there is no conflict of interest for anyone with the ability to control content of this activity. We are recording this session and will post a modified version of it on lbbc.org. Due to licensing requirements, the recorded version will include the film trailer rather than the full documentary. We will notify you via email when the recording is available. In addition to the recording, we'll be sharing several resources via email that we hope will be helpful to you. These include a blog, Life as a Realistic Optimist, written by Judy Erdahl, whom you'll get to know during the documentary, links to recordings of Kelly Grosslogs speaking at previous LBBC conferences on metastatic breast cancer, and a link to LBBC's healthcare provider landing page where you can access resources for providers and patients. Our learning objectives for today's program are for providers to learn ways to have difficult conversations with patients in a humanistic and approachable manner through focusing on life goals, what matters most and who matters most to them, to develop a better understanding of good patient syndrome along with ways to recognize this as a barrier to honest conversation with your patients and the importance of addressing it, 
to learn to view end of life conversations as a privilege to have with your patients as it becomes an integral part of good patient care and to understand the importance of addressing mental health with patients at all phases of care, including end of life. It's now my pleasure to introduce our expert speaker. For nearly 30 years, Kelly Groslog's licensed independent clinical social worker has helped patients, families, caregivers, and clinicians understand and cope with grief, loss, and traumatic illness through her work in palliative care, hospice, emergency rooms, and her private psychotherapy practice. She has sat at the bedside of hundreds of patients during their final breaths. Kelly is board certified in clinical social work and completed a fellowship in grief counseling from the American Academy of Healthcare Professionals. She's a sought after public speaker, author, podcast host, and social media blogger, as well as award-winning executive producer of the documentary, Dying is Not Giving Up. Welcome, Kelly, and thank you for being here with us today. Oh, Stephanie, thank you so much. And thank you to LBBC for uh, sponsoring this, this wonderful opportunity. Thank you to all of my colleagues out there that have attended today. I know this is a tough time of day, and I, I do think you're going to be very glad that you were able to attend I just want to give you a little bit of a backstory on how this documentary became part of the educational process that we have going on um, today. Judy Erdahl, who you will meet in this documentary, is um, just a wonderful, beautiful woman. I actually was introduced to LBBC through Judy. She was a client of mine back here in Minneapolis and a wonderful friend and advocate of LBBC and their incredible services. So several years ago, Judy introduced us together. I was able to speak at their conferences for metastatic breast cancer. And when I left private practice almost two years ago to teach and speak, Judy asked me, what was I going to be doing with my time? Um, I did see my terminal patients till the end. She asked me, what are you going to do with your time, Kelly? And I said, you know, Judy, I really want to create an educational film. And at that point, I didn't intend for it to be called a documentary. I didn't intend for it to be in film festivals, etc. And she said, I want to be in it. And I said, that would just, that would be so amazing, Judy, if you could be in it. However, I knew that Judy had weeks to live and I was nowhere near getting this ready. Well, I got home from that, that session, that conversation with her. She called me and said, I have to be in it. I just don't want to be in it. I have to be in it. So I called up my good friend, Brian Pyatt, who is a wonderful, talented um, film videographer and wonderful friend of mine and a wonderful friend of Judy's. And Brian became the executive, co-executive producer with me and we got it together. We got, I hired the camera crew, we got together and we were able to create this beautiful documentary. So I am so excited that you are here today. I encourage you to stay on for after where we can have a rich conversation. You can ask questions, but truly for the next 35 minutes, I invite you to enjoy this beautiful woman and her wisdom, Judy Erdahl. So Annika, if you wouldn't mind starting the documentary now, I'll see you guys back here after. What is dying like? Oh, well, I can tell you what it's like for me. I don't know what it's like for everybody else. Every morning when I wake up, it takes about 10 or 20 seconds to remember that Judy's dying of cancer. It's terrifying when you realize that all of a sudden, you really are gonna die from this disease. There's a lot of loss, but it's such an opportunity for love, too. I've seen some of the most beautiful healing in the last five minutes or last five days of somebody's life. So cure is off the table, but healing never is. We can be hopeful even at the end of life. I do hope that end of life conversations will become less scary and that truly it will be seen as one of your greatest privileges as a medical provider. So what matters most now? It's my people, my people, my people, my dog, my people. 
We still have a lot of laughs and tip a glass of champagne probably way too often. This is never about giving up. Dying is not about giving up. It's a process of kind of removing myself from this world and getting ready for whatever comes next. We do know that you are going to die. How you're going to die is what I want to talk to you about today. Welcome back, everybody, and Kelly, and thank you so much for sharing this unbelievably powerful and moving documentary with us, and thank you to Judy, too. Um, I am moved every time I see this. Today is no exception, and I just want to recognize that um, I suspect a lot of people in the audience are, are experiencing some significant emotions right now, and I just want to take a moment and um, recognize that. Uh, so we have time now to move on. We are very fortunate and, to have Kelly here to do some discussion with us. And I'm sure there are a lot of questions and comments um, from the audience. I've seen some really insightful questions uh, come in. So I'm looking, we have just under um, 30 minutes actually for discussion, which is really great. Um, Kelly will do her best to get to as many questions as possible today. Um, and please remember to enter your questions into the Q&A so that we can see them um, and to not include any identifying information about your patients, please. Um, so Kelly, as I mentioned, there are a lot of great questions. Uh, I'm going to start with one I think is really important. Um, what suggestions do you have for oncologists who do not have access to social work or mental health practitioners in their practice. Mm -hmm. They're often leery of asking about mental health issues because they don't have research, the resources to support that need in their patients. First of all, everybody, thank you for all your beautiful comments. I've just been taking them in um, as, I'm, as I've been watching this and Judy would be so thrilled for how you are responding. Um, one thing we didn't mention is this was created to go into the medical schools and nursing schools and PA schools, as well as um, current practices for training. And my hope is that many oncologists will be able to watch this um, going forward because the question is absolutely poignant, that it is hard to address some of these things when A, we're not trained in it, but also it's hard to address it when we don't necessarily have access to resources, especially in rural, uh, rural medicine. However, I think it's important that it is addressed regardless, um, that there are so many today, there are so many virtual support systems, LBBC being one of them, many support systems for American Cancer Society, different things that have moved virtually and we need to ask about patients' mental health. I think, um, I think that, that it's key. And I will say that sometimes, or oftentimes actually, when oncologists call me and say, I don't know what's going on, that medically this person should be doing better because all their numbers are good, their scans are good, but they don't seem to be doing as well. And I'll say, have you assessed their mental health? Things like, are you sleeping? Are you crying? Are you ruminating? Um, can you concentrate? Because oncologists can start medication if that's what's needed, can start an antidepressant and then look into groups of therapists. Um, even the smallest towns have counselors and therapists. One place to start is to call up your folks at your hospice um, agency that you refer to and ask who they refer to. So that might be that might be something. I know it can be an intimidating thing because you may not feel trained for specific um, psychiatric or mental health, you know, responses. But I will say that your patients will do better if their mental health is addressed. There's just we have empirical data. I have personal data um, to say that, and it's just it's so important. People at the end of their life deserve mentally to feel well. And so it's not only for those patients that have years to live, it's also for those patients that have months to live. I think we have to, we have to address it. Thank you, Kelly. 
Um, there are a lot of good questions. I'm just going to keep going for a minute and then I'll turn and see if you've noticed any that you want to um, make sure we answer. Okay. Um, somebody asked, how do you approach end of life with terminal clients in therapy when they don't seem to want to go down this road, even when it is obvious the client's still feeling hopeful that I will get better? Okay. Um, you know, hope is something that everybody gets and it's not my job, um, as their therapist to, to, to dictate their hope for them. Um, people get to choose what they want to be hopeful for. You know, I, what I often will say to people, I, I ask them actually more than tell them, I ask them, what do you understand about your disease? And, you know, um, in therapy, I would often have a release of information with their oncology team so that I could, so I could get a sense of really what's going on, whether it's from scans, whether it's from blood work, whether it's from tumor markers, whatever that may be, I'll ask them, what do you understand about your disease? And then I get a sense from that. And I will tell you as a social worker or a therapist, I was in a fortunate position in that I could really talk to my clients about everything. I, I had enough trust with them that I would be able to kind of cross that line a little bit and say to them, that isn't how I understand things to be going. And, um, and I'm wondering if you need, you know, if, if people are not explaining it well enough to you, or if maybe this is a, this is fear. And so then we get to fear. I tend to address, I don't like the word denial per se, because I think it puts a lot of shame on people. And so what I like to do, at it, I, I ask people, what are you most scared of um, in, in this? And what scares you most about the disease process? And to go from there, you know, I honestly, I don't know that I've ever worked with somebody that's dying, that doesn't at some level know they're dying. That doesn't necessarily mean they want to talk about dying, but that, you know, and that's two different things. So what I talk about is the gift of time. And I know that somebody on here put, they have children. You know, Judy set the bar very, very high. You know, these aren't necessarily things everybody's doing. They're not necessarily doing teddy bears and all these things, and they don't have to. But it's about the gift of time. And that right now you have an opportunity to take and maybe write letters to your kids. These things don't make people die because they do them. Talking about dying doesn't make people die. It just gives people the opportunity to, to really be present later in life if they do die from their disease. And so again, rather than going at it and kind of getting into a power struggle with people about, well, your hope is not realistic and you're this and that, it's more about letting them have that space. But then also asking, you know, what scares you the most right now about what you're going through? And then we, we go from there. That's kind of a... Um, a lead off area, if you will, then we go from there. And that tends to be a gentle way. It tends to kind of break things open and, um, and allows them to have the opportunity to speak, which I think is just so important. Okay. Thank you so much for your reflections on that. Um, I have a, an, a number of additional questions um, ready from the audience, but I just want to take a moment and see if there were any you noticed that you wanted to be sure to get to uh, before uh -huh. I keep going. And it's fine if not. You know, I will just say, Stephanie, I know there's a lot in here about how to get the film. And so I'm glad that Amy put, and I think you'll also be putting something up. It's multiple questions. So I just want to say there, there is the, um, there is our landing page on my website. Okay. And also we do have a community screening coming up November 15th. So that information's on there too, for people that want to be able to see this, but um, I just wanted to address that because I'm getting, I'm getting some private things and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that on here. So I just wanted to address that, that there's all that information right on our website. That's great. Thank you for, for answering that. That's a really important one. Yeah. And just a reminder to everybody, if you have a question, please to include that in the Q and A at the bottom of your screen. It's a little bit harder to keep up with them when they come into the chat. Um, so this is, a, I think, a really important question that somebody asked. 
do you cry with your patients? I am very empathic and I find myself really holding my tears until I get to my office because I never want my patient to worry about my tears when they're going through so many emotional and physical changes. Is there a way to decrease my empathic response? <laughs> um, well, empathy is one of our, was, is one of our superpowers in this work. And, and it's also one of our liabilities, quite frankly. Um, you know, b- being authentic is the best way we can be with people. And sometimes that involves crying with them. Um, I tear up often with people and I will say, you know, I think we have to, we have to reflect on our own emotional status. And sometimes we're crying for many reasons. And those are the things we need to, to look at outside of our practice. You know, maybe we have some family things going on, maybe some stuff's getting brought up, triggered, whatever that may be. But I don't ever want people to feel like you can't be authentic with your patients. Um, yes, it's, it's concerning if the patient feels like they have to take care of you. But sometimes um, what I've heard from my patients in sessions is that they felt really acknowledged and seen because the doctor was just sitting there with them having watery eyes. We have to remember we're human first, social worker second, physician second, nurse second, we're human first. And there are some situations that if we're very, very present, which we should be with all of our patients, if we're present and truly tuned in to what's going on, we are going to have emotion. It's just plain and simple. There's just, there's no way around it. And I think, you know, watery eyes and we, we live in a culture that that's seen as it's not, it's not valued. Crying is not valued here, especially if you're a man. Um, And then there's this kind of rule that in our profession as providers, we're not supposed to have this emotion. We're supposed to look like we have it all figured out and put together. And, you know, again, I think you can only, each of us can only know really where those tears come from. Are they, are they an empathic reaction to what is in front of you or are they all laden with some stuff that maybe we're carrying in our own personal life? Then we need to get support and seek counsel outside of the patient situation. But, you know, doing this for almost 30 years, I have, I have been mad with patients right along with them. I have been upset and it's just an authentic way to connect. So I don't know, um, you know, empathy isn't really something we can turn down or turn off. It's just, it's some of us are more empaths than others. And I think really good self-care is important. Um, sometimes I'll put a beautiful white light around me before I go into a, a hard situation. And it's almost a protective, it's not to keep the person out, It's just to protect that their story is their story and my story is my story. And to not take on what they're struggling with, but to hold space and be present for it. And sometimes a light feels really good as just kind of this like thing that I can do because we have to take care of ourselves. And when you're an empath, you tend to have more body aches, more pain, sleeplessness, headaches, um, crying, you know, those types of things. And so I, I think it's really important. Um, yeah, thanks for, oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's just to take care of yourself, but boy, we're going to lose a lot if we feel robotic going into this work, you know, be very, very present and um, patients can sense when you're really present. And I'll tell you, crying sometimes is, it's about all we can do. I mean, there's just no words for some of this. And sometimes it's just, we just sit there in in silence and I've had tears just coming down my eyes and there's just, there's no words. Thanks for sharing that and and being so personal and and human with everybody here today as well as you always are. Um, I am glad you also talked about self-care because that is so important for everybody who is doing this work. Um, There's an interesting question about uh, trust that that came in. I'm going to read that one. It says, um, you've mentioned trust quite often. What are some practices that you have found that help to build that trust and rapport quickly with a patient? Has there ever been a time where trust with a patient was broken? If so, were you able to repair it and how? Hmm. Um, 
oh, I'm sure over the years I've messed up many times. I can't, I can't think of a specific, I guess one of the things for trust is, um, is that we follow through, we don't overpromise, and that we follow through when we say we're going to do something that can be as basic as I'm going to get you a phone number for a flower shop, uh, for the funeral, or whatever it may be. And, and to follow up with that, we don't ever want to overpromise. I think on the front end, that feels really good. Um, because people think, Oh my gosh, she's really on top of it, or he's really on top of it. But if we can't follow through with those things, that's what breaks down trust. Um, I, I will also say one of the things for trust building is to really be present with people. I mean, they trust and safety are the same kind of the same thing. And I really want people to feel safe with me. And that might include um, holding that confidence. There's things that we really need to hold in confidence and maybe they don't want other team members knowing. And I say to people, if you're not gonna hurt yourself or another person, I can hold this for you. I can hold this, um, this thing you're telling me and, and the rest of the team doesn't have to know about this. It's not really relevant. It's, it's maybe something that happened to them a long time ago and they just need somebody to talk to about that. It's not relevant to their, their care. And so I need to know, because if I, if I broke that trust and told somebody, there's a chance that I could get back to that patient. And so um, but I also am very honest with people and I'll say to people, I know you didn't want me to talk about this. And, you know, I have to say that I told you up front, if I felt you were going to hurt yourself, I do, I'm mandated to do that. And so I'll tell them that I do have to talk to the physician or I do have to talk to the nurse practitioner about this because I am mandated to do that. And it's in your best interest that other people know so I don't go behind patients' backs and do those things. I'm very upfront with my patients. These are things I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to say and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, I think, you know, and, and I'm, I'm very much about asking people. Um, you can kind of tell if people, you know, and some people just have trust issues. This, isn't, this doesn't mean that we're not good providers or that we didn't do everything in our power to build that trust. But people come to us after they're diagnosed with cancer, they come to us with a whole life story and they maybe have been abused. There maybe have things that have gone on that we would understand on paper, like, oh, I can understand where they don't trust. And so, you know, we do our best. We do our best that people will trust us. But just remember that you're working with two people in the relationship. And you can only represent your piece that you bring in whatever you can do. But I will tell you, one of the greatest things you can do for people to build their trust is to be present. And that means not on your pager, not on your cell phone, not um, so, you know, I understand we have to do the medical record and it's electronic and we're typing, but we all have the ability to sit and look at somebody um, for part of their session. And even if it's two minutes, that builds trust. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I wanna give a lot of credit to this audience today. I first and foremost for the amazing work we know they're out there doing with people across the country and actually even beyond that. Um, but for these very thoughtful questions, I'm gonna keep going with them. They're beautiful. Um, somebody asked this question, I'm a patient navigator and my patients usually decline counseling services, but they like to share their emotions with me. Mm -hmm. While I enjoy listening to them and giving them my attention, I wonder how I can effectively introduce counseling to them during end of life. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And um, whoever asked it, kudos to you because you clearly have built that trust and that rapport with your patients. So thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of stigma about mental health counseling in our society, even today. And there's some families, I've worked with many people where the families have said, you know, you're not going to that shrink or you're not going to that whatever, or, you're not going to this, um, referring to me um, or referring to a counselor and they're not necessarily supportive of it. And so sometimes it comes down to, we have to break down some of those barriers within a family. And, you know, it's 
sometimes it's the language we use, whether it's counselor, actually, and therapist, some people have a preference over one or the other. Um, support person, you know, this is somebody that we use for the majority of our patients. And I'm wondering, would you be willing just to have one or two sessions with this person? Um, you know, this, and then we give them the sales, the sales pitch about this is actually helping you like it is when you go to your lymphedema specialist or when you go to your nutritionist or whatever that may be, would you be willing just to meet with this person for two times? And that's kind of one of the ways that people can sell this is they don't want to sign up necessarily for the end all be all, but they might be willing to go two times. And it's also okay for us to set boundaries as a nurse navigator. I, you know, I have the opportunity. I can, I can spend a half hour with you. We can talk about things I wish, but I'm not trained as a therapist, a, but also I wish I could spend more time with you, but my schedule only allots this amount of time and it's okay to set boundaries with people. I mean, again, we can't be the end all be all to everybody. So it's okay to say to people up front, I am very honored to hear your story. I will tell you that I'm not trained as a counselor or a therapist, but I also only have a half hour. I want to be able to give you my undivided attention during this half hour, but I also have other patients I have to. And so it's okay to, it's okay to do that. I think it's important to do that actually, um, to be very clear about what your role is and to be very clear about what you're comfortable with, with patients. So ask them, you know, would they be willing to do, one to two sessions. If you have a lot of patients that are needing support, but they don't necessarily want to go to therapy or don't necessarily need therapy, there are wonderful support groups online. And there are wonderful, for breast cancer in particular, there are wonderful closed Facebook groups and different things where people don't necessarily need to see a trained therapist. They just need somebody to hear them and their story. And don't you think, Stephanie? I mean, it's like those groups are invaluable for people because they are really with people that are walking a similar path to them. I agree. I think there's so much in the validation of that being heard in whatever setting it is. And absolutely online groups or Facebook groups can be a wonderful way to do that. Um, thank you, Kelly, for, for sharing that. And I agree that was a really important question. Uh, just to let you know, we've got just a little bit over five minutes left for questions. Somehow the time is flying. I know, and I think, oh my gosh. I, know, um, I think this is a really important one that just came in from somebody in the audience. Have you found any ways to help physicians and other providers become more receptive to or confident in having frank, honest conversations with their patients about dying? I was on an inpatient palliative care team in my second field placement during social work school so my team was very good at these conversations, but other providers were often and understandably more hesitant to engage in these conversations on their own. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Thank you for all of these beautiful questions. My goodness, they're just incredible. I, um, yeah, when I work in, when I worked at inpatient palliative care at the university, it it actually was very interesting at the University of Minnesota. It actually was very interesting because we were seen as kind of adversarial with some of the some of the specialties, um, the medical specialties. And one of the ways that well, this is this is one of the reasons this documentary was created is, and it is actually making huge impacts on current physicians who are in who are in the emergency room, cardiology, oncology. Um, them bringing it into their practice, which has been very beautiful. I will often ask physicians if they would like me to sit with them um, as they have this conversation with people, because I think one of the things is it feels hard to, to switch that role when the patient has been looking at this particular person as the cure or as the, you know, whatever, extend my life, whatever that may be. But I, but I tell physicians that it is mu as much our obligation ethically to talk to people about all the options, even when that includes stopping treatment, as it is whatever other ethical things that you may believe in. And that 
people feel abandoned by their physicians when physicians aren't honest with them or the medical team isn't honest with them. And you want to talk about breaking down trust. And if we save the, the beautiful thing about Dr. Xander in this documentary is that they had conversations as Judy's cancer. I mean, she was with him for eight years. So he touched base with her often. And I think that's what's important. We have to do that. We have to talk about life goals often. If we save this hard conversation for the end, it's we're going to do, try to avoid it. We're going to try to deny it. And then our patients maybe have lost really beautiful opportunities. And they may feel duped. They may feel abandoned if this isn't, if this is saved for the end. So it's these conversations that, you know, we're seeing some progression in your cancer. I do have this treatment option that I can offer you, but I'm wondering if this doesn't work, how are you feeling about things? And if, you know, this is where the dying is not giving up came from because Judy saw so many people think that if they stop treatment or if they, the doctors talk to them about something that we're all giving up. And that's not at all what this is. This is honoring what is being ethical, being loving and, and truly furthermore, just being human with your patients. And thank you. That's such an important topic all around. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. It's hard to pick. Um, I'm going to go with this one. Uh, can you please share any insights about supporting mothers with metastatic breast cancer who have young children and the particular grief experienced by parents who are dying before their children reach adulthood? You know, you talked a little bit about kids earlier. Yeah. So my mother died when I was 11. And I can say that much of what I know and I counsel comes from my life without a mother and, and what would have helped me along the way. So my mother died of cardiac disease when she was 33 and it was sudden. So we didn't, you know, she didn't have opportunities to write cards for me or, um, tell me things that she wanted for me going on. So I think one of the things to look at is that you, as a, as a parent, as a mother, um, I am a mother. And so the children become the forefront of everything when it comes to disease. And what I told all my, what I've told all my patients is that your children will be okay and they will land okay if they have what they need to land. So that's people in their life. Um, you will stay present in their life. We want to help patients stay present in their life, even after they die. Again, it doesn't have to be as um, creative as Judy, but it can be a letter. It can be a voice um, recorded thing. It can be a special piece of jewelry, whatever that may be. And I think nobody, so the thing I know in working with the dying things I've heard over the years, the two things that are so important to them is they don't want to be forgotten, but they also want people that they love to continue living. And so we can do both. And we can encourage people to continue to live, but how do you help your patients stay present when their child goes to kindergarten, when their child gets married, when their child graduates from high school, how do we help them? And, and people need our guidance. They don't necessarily know. Again, and I know we're coming down to time again, um, these Facebook groups or these closed groups online are so amazing because they talk to each other. They get ideas from each other. They, they hear about these things from each other. And I know as I've watched people, these are very difficult things to do. These are very emotional things to do. But as a woman who would have loved these things from her mother, um, I will tell you, I think it will be worth it. I, I really think it will be worth it and it'll be down the road with your child. It will be a beautiful thing for them, for them to have. Thanks so much, Kelly. And thank you for sharing your experience personally. I wish we had another two too. hours. I know. And I am sure that many people who are participating wish we had that additional time. Um, I just wanted to respond to something that somebody asked uh, before we wrap up about finding the link to the community screening in mid-November that you mentioned. 
-hmm. in approximately a week, as soon as the modified version of the recording is posted, we'll send everybody who was registered an email that'll have the link to the community screening. So if you're having trouble finding it, uh, rest assured, we will get that out to you pretty soon. Wonderful. Um, so, so unfortunately, it is all the time we have for, for questions. And Kelly, on behalf of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, I want to thank you very deeply um, for all that you have done and, and given today. And, and a thank you to Judy as well. Um, it just means so very much. Um, sure. Um, I want to also recognize the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for their support of this program. And remind everybody that there is an evaluation link coming any minute. Please remember to complete that for us no later than October 13th. For those of you who do request contact hours, CEs, or a certificate of participation, you'll be emailed your certificate by November 3rd. And like I said, we'll be sending a link to the modified recording and some other resources soon. So I wanna thank all of you for participating in today's program and for the care that you provide to people with breast cancer every day. We hope that you will join us for future educational programs. So with that, have a good rest of your day and thank you again for being part of today's program. Thank you everybody and thank you LBBC.